Good morning everyone and welcome to the 2014 edition of the Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Dr. Victoria Arbor. Victoria is a recent PhD graduate from the University of Alberta, a degree she successfully completed last December. Victoria is originally from Halifax, Nova Scotia. She obtained her bachelor's degree in Earth Sciences from Dalhousie University in Halifax. For her senior undergrad thesis, Victoria described dinosaur remains discovered in northern British Columbia in the 70s, which at the time were the first dinosaur skeletal remains ever discovered in that province. After completing her bachelor's degree, Victoria moved to Edmonton to pursue a master's degree in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta. For her master's thesis, Victoria investigated the biomechanics of tail clubbing in ankylosaurid dinosaurs. She liked ankylosaurs so much that she decided to continue studying these animals in the context of a PhD also at the University of Alberta. For her dissertation, she did a major revision of ankylosaurids from around the world in order to better understand their evolution and biogeography. Over the years, Victoria has participated in fieldwork in Alberta, Nova Scotia, Mon Mongolia, and Argentina. And finally, many people in the audience will be interested to learn that Victoria was one of the lead developers for the University of Alberta's new online dinosaur call, course called Dino 101, and that she was a scientific consultant for the Walking with Dinosaurs 3D movie that came out last December. So today, Victoria will present the results of a taxonomic revision she conducted of the ankylosaurid Euoplocephalus, a study that has revealed the hidden diversity of ankylosaurs here in ancient Alberta. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Victoria Arbor. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Stay completely silent if you can hear me. Okay, um, so I'll apologize in advance. I'm on the tail end of a cold, so I may be slightly croaky as we go through this talk, but um, we'll, we'll see how far we can get before I lose my voice. I also have to give thanks to uh, Colin Van Buren, who was at the University of Toronto for coming up with Huoplocephalus because I thought it was funny, so I have shamelessly stolen it from my talk here um, on Huoplocephalus. So this is a, was a pretty big part of my research at the University of Alberta for my PhD project, and um, I think has a lot of implications for how we understand ankylosaurid diversity around the whole world. Um, so it really speaks to the importance of Albertan fossils um, for understanding dinosaurs uh, in many other places as well. So hopefully everyone here knows at least a little bit about what an ankylosaurid is, but I'll just go through a quick overview and introduction to them for anyone uh, for whom this is new. So ankylosaurids are pretty much the ugliest dinosaurs that were out there. These are the armored dinosaurs that are kind of like walking coffee tables. They're very short and squat. They walk on all four legs. They've got bones in their skin called osteoderms that they sort of float right in the skin. So they're very different compared to what our bodies are like. Uh, they usually have little horns and bumps on their skulls. And one group, the group that I'm most interested, interested in, uh, are the ones that have clubs on the end of their tails. So that's the ankylosaurid ankylosaurs. Ankylosaurs are part of a broader group of dinosaurs called the thyreophorans, and these are the, the big group of armored dinosaurs. So again, they include the ankylosaurs like Cychania from Mongolia. Uh, they include the stegosaurs like the iconic stegosaurus from the western USA. Uh, and they also include some really early forms like Scylodosaurus, um, so very early representatives that don't fall into either the stegosaur or ankylosaur groups. And so stegosaurs have those osteoderms just running along <coughs> the very back of their, uh, the sort in two rows along their back, but ankylosaurs have osteoderms all over their bodies, um, so that's the main difference between those two groups. I became interested in Euoplocephalus, the genus of ankylosaur from Alberta, while I was doing my master's research on ankylosaur tail clubbing. And so for that particular project, I was looking at the anatomy of tail clubs and uh, what shapes they had, what sizes they had, so that I could do some biomechanical modeling. Uh, I did some CT scanning of different tail clubs. And one of the things that really struck me was that tail clubs come in an awful lot of shapes and sizes, but all, suppose, all of these different tail clubs supposedly belong to just 
one genus and species called Euoplocephalus tutus, or tutus, I guess, if you wanted to say it that way, which is quite silly. Um, so ankylosaurs, uh, Euoplocephalus tail clubs uh, could be as small as about 15 centimeters across, like the one I'm holding in my hands here at the Royal Ontario Museum, or as large as 60 centimeters across, which is quite gigantic. That is a really big ball of bone to be holding at the end of your tail. And in between, there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes. So I was really curious about whether or not all of these actually represented the same species of ankylosaur. Uh, maybe they represented different growth stages. Maybe it was males and females. Maybe they're just really variable between individuals. Or maybe there was actually more than one species represented by Euoplocephalus tail clubs. <coughs> And so uh, most of these tail clubs come from uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park. A few of them come from the area around Drumheller all the way up to Dry Island. Uh, but all of you are probably familiar with the idea that um, rocks in Alberta uh, aren't all don't all represent the same age and time. And even in Dinosaur Provincial Park, the rocks were laid down over a pretty long span of time, millions of years. Uh, and the different layers of rocks uh, can represent different species. So <coughs> it's important to know the stratigraphic distribution or what layer of rock the different fossils actually come from. So that was really important in my study. And there's been a lot of work uh, over recent years um, by a lot of different researchers working on Alberta fossils to understand what dinosaur species are found at what stratigraphic level, especially in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And as it turns out, not every dinosaur species in Dinosaur Provincial Park is found at the same time. So they weren't all contemporaries of each other. They didn't all live alongside each other. And one of the most recent revisions is by uh, Jordan Mallon, who's now at the CMN. And he did a really good study where he showed that um, you get sort of different dinosaurs in about the lower 30 meters compared to the ones in the upper 30 meters, and especially right at the very top in the Lethbridge coal zone. So um, uh, we see this in ceratopsians, we see this in hadrosaurs, and we see this in the nodosaurid ankylosaurs, the other big group of ankylosaurs that don't have tail clubs. But up until recently, uh, Euoplocephalus was found just completely throughout the formation. So it was reported from coming from all of those different levels. So that's a little bit weird, but maybe there's something special going on with Euoplocephalus where it just remained the same for a long period of time while all of the other dinosaur species were changing around it. Um, so that's like plausible, but a little bit weird. Uh, what's probably not possible is that Euoplocephalus would be found in all of the formations in Alberta, which is also the pattern that we saw in the publications. So uh, Euoplocephalus had been reported uh, throughout the Dinosaur Park formation, throughout the longer and larger Horseshoe Canyon formation, and also down in the, the Old Man formation and the Foremost formation. So that is very weird. So most dinosaurs are not found at all the same levels in Dinosaur Provincial Park, and it's extremely rare for dinosaurs, uh, the same species, to be found in different formations in Alberta too. So uh, this is probably wrong, and that was sort of my starting hypothesis. So uh, we see a lot of variation in Euoplocephalus. It has an unusually long stratigraphic range, so it was more than one species represented by what we were calling Euoplocephalus. Uh, is that long stratigraphic range real? Again, if it was real, it's telling us something really interesting about Euoplocephalus, because obviously Euoplocephalus is doing something really different. But my suspicion was that we had actually lumped in several species into Euoplocephalus, and we were actually looking at a couple of different species. <clears throat> so who is Euoplocephalus? I've talked about this guy for a few minutes now. Um, this is the holotype specimen. So this is the named type specimen for Euoplocephalus. It is not great. <laughs> um, what we're looking at is a chunk of the skull representing kind of the forehead region. I'll point it out here on the screen. So this is, this is the chunk of the skull. It's got this very characteristic scaly look to it that's characteristic of ankylosaurs from North America. Um, and we're kind of looking at sort of the front of the snout to back to just before the orbits. We also have this really neat structure called a cervical half ring. That's this yoke-like structure over here. And this is something really unique to ankylosaurs and especially to ankylosaurid ankylosaurs. So what we're looking at is a series of six osteoderms, six keeled osteoderms, uh, and they're sitting on a weird uh, segmented flat bone that encircles half of the neck. So it's kind of like a yoke, um, or a, uh, we call it a half ring. So that's, that's a very weird bone that you don't really get in other dinosaurs. And the nice thing is that the, the half rings of different ankylosaurids actually look like they're kind of distinct at the species level, or at least at the genus level. 
So we can use the shape of the osteoderms, um, how tall they are, uh, what shape the keel is on them. We can use that for understanding uh, what species is valid and what species maybe, or what specimens are the same. And the nice thing is that even though we only have a little bit of this particular animal, it turns out that the half ring is very distinctive. And so we can use the half ring to refer other specimens to Euoplocephalus. So Euoplocephalus also has a slightly complicated taxonomic history and naming history. Um, originally, it was called Stereocephalus, but like many things, that was a beetle. So that didn't work very well. Um, so it was renamed Euoplocephalus tutus in 1910. Uh, and then over the, during the 20s, there were three more ankylosaur genera named from Alberta. We had Anodontosaurus, with me, which means toothless lizard, uh, Dioplosaurus, and Scolosaurus, all named during the 20s. So for a while, we had four different genera and species of ankylosaurs from Alberta. In the 1970s, uh, Walter Coombs, who was a really important and uh, sort of groundbreaking ankylosaur researcher, he, he did a really big revision of all of the ankylosaurs that we knew of um, everywhere. So that's a big project. Uh, and he, he, in particular, revised the ankylosaurs from Alberta and considered that uh, all these four species actually just represented one species because there was so much variation and there weren't any sort of patterns to the variation. So he said, either we have to name every single skull that we find a new species, which wouldn't make any sense, or probably all of these represent the same species. And that was really reasonable because at the time we didn't have as good an understanding of the stratigraphic distribution or the pattern that we see in other dinosaurs. And so that was pretty reasonable. So he lumped all of these different species into Euoplocephalus, and that's pretty much how it has stood uh, since 1978. So my project was a little bit to kind of check and see if, if I agreed or disagreed with Coombs's revision. And the main way that I did that, it wasn't, it wasn't very high tech. My master's research was really high tech and cool to talk about because I did things like CT scanning and digital modeling and cool stuff. And this project was not as high tech because I basically like looked at things and thought about them. So that was sort of like old school paleontology there. Uh, so I went to a lot of different museums and tried to look at every Euoplocephalus that existed that I knew of. Um, so everyone that had been published on and uh, a lot of new things, especially here at the Terrell Museum that had been collected since Coombs did his research. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me. Ankylosaurs and other dinosaurs from Alberta have kind of migrated out of Alberta uh, over the years. And so in order to do this project, I had to visit like the American Museum of Natural History in New York, <coughs> the uh, Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and even as far as the British Museum in London, uh, there's a couple of ankylosaurs that had sort of made their way over there. So it took a long time because it takes a while to get to all of those different museums. Uh, but I actually have a sample size, which is very nice in paleontology because usually you have like less than one specimen. So, so, in, uh, so I've got a pretty good sample size with like 30-ish skulls of varying completeness. <clears throat> and I just basically tried to look for any sort of patterns in the shapes or sizes or um, uh, ornamentation patterns between the skulls. The first thing that I was interested in was how taphonomy might influence how we interpret the morphology or shape of the skulls. And so taphonomy is the study of what happens to a fossil uh, or a, an animal from the time that it dies to the time that it is collected. And so in particular, I was interested in what happens to the fossil during the fossilization process <coughs> when it's got all of this weight of rock above it, it's turning into a rock itself. <coughs> and a lot of times what happens is fossils can become squished and distorted. And I thought that that might actually be influencing how we interpret the shape and anatomy of these fossils. So if you take a look at these two skulls here, these uh, supposedly belong to the same species of ankylosaur, Euoplocephalus. Uh, the one on the, I have to think here, your left is UALVP31 at the U of A, and the other one is h 5405 at the American Museum in New York. Uh, h 5405 is one of the nicest skulls and specimens out there. It's got part of its postcrania as well. Uh, UALVP is pretty good too. It's not as complete, but that's okay. And you can see that the skulls look a little bit different. Uh, UALVP31 is much flatter, and the orbit, which is a bit dark on the screen here, but it's, it's very elliptical or oval compared to the skull AMNH5405, which is nice and arched, has a nice circular orbit. 
And so some people had suggested that maybe the shape of the orbit was actually uh, a good indicator of different species. So if you have a more oval orbit, that might actually be kind of useful for telling about a part species. But I thought that was a little bit odd because to me, an orbit should probably be circular because your eye is spherical, um, unless you're an owl or something weird like that. So <clears throat> um, I, I decided that I would take a look and see if we could use orbit shape as something called a strain ellipse. So that's something that geologists use to understand how uh, a rock has been deformed and squished through geological pressure. And so we call it a strain ellipse. And a strain ellipse is really easy. It's basically just anything that should be circular that isn't anymore. Then you can use that to understand how much deformation has taken place. So the first step was that I measured a whole bunch of orbits of extant animals, so living animals, uh, and I found that orbits should be mostly circular. So that was nice to see because I sort of had just guessed at that, but it turns out it's actually true. An orbit should be mostly circular. Um, and so if you see an oval orbit in an ankylosaur skull, it's probably been squished. So again, not perhaps very like surprising, but it's nice to be able to show that you know, with like numbers and science and things. <laughs> So with that, I then made, this is the, like the cool part of my project here, like the high tech part. Um, I made some digital models of a couple of these skulls, so UALVP31 and AMNH5405, and then I squished them, but in the computer, because if I tried to do that to the real thing, I don't think people would be very happy. So I squished my digital skulls, and as I started to squish them, uh, I squished AMNH5405, which looks like it should be probably the original shape, because it's got a nice circular orbit. And as it turns out, uh, as you squish the skulls, they start to look more and more like UALVP31. So the skull becomes flatter in the snout region, but there's some other things that uh, you may, might not expect. So for example, the squamosal horns, the little horns at the back of the skull here, are very erect in UALVP31, and they're not as erect in AMNH405. But as you start to squish the skull, they look like they're more erect. So that's one difference. Uh, also the angle that the quadrado jugal horn, so a little horn underneath the eye, um, as, that, uh, as the skull gets squished, becomes sort of more horizontal, which you also see in UALVP31. So it's nice to be able to show that just squishing the skull can actually change a lot of different things uh, about the skull. Um, so you need to be really careful about using uh, things like angles of projection of different skull parts in terms of understanding variation. So just because a skull has a more upright squamosal horn doesn't necessarily mean that it's a different species. That could just be from squishing. So you just have to be really careful. The other thing that I did to sort of check this hypothesis was I did something called finite element analysis. So I made 3D models and turned them into sort of Lego bricks and then told the computer to put a force at the top of the skull and hold the skull steady along the bottom. And then what you can do is check out things like stress and strain. So this, this diagram is showing strain and strain is just shape change so how much shape change has occurred once you put that force onto the skull and it turns out that the areas that are most likely to experience shape change are the squamosal or the quadrado jugal horns the front of the snout around the nose so kind of like what we're seeing when I was pushing and pulling on the digital models of the skulls so <clears throat> the main take-home message here is that uh, the amount that the snout is arched and the erectness of the squamosal horns are really easily influenced by taphonomy so it doesn't mean that they aren't also influenced by biology but we have to be really careful in interpreting things um, like that when we're looking at fossils because almost every fossil is squished in some way. <clears throat> so the next step was that I wanted to know whether or not the ornamentation on the skulls could be used for understanding uh, species differences in ankylosaurs. So ankylosaurs have these really interesting, ornate, unusual skulls with all kinds of little scale patterns on them. And we call these little scale patterns capitegulae, which I know is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a good and useful word. We're not sure if the, this ornamentation is the result of the skull bones being sort of sculptured from sort of the ground up, or if what we're seeing are osteoderms that have fused down onto the skull. It looks like a little bit of both of those things is happening in ankylosaur skulls. So capitegulum is nice because we aren't using the word osteoderm. It's just referring to little tiles of ornamentation on the skull, sort of independent of where they come from. So, that, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but that, that's the word that sort of works best for that. So in adult ankylosaurs, the skull is completely fused up and you can't see any of the boundaries between the original bones and then everything is sort of overwritten by these capitegulae. But in juvenile ankylosaurs like this Panacosaurus from Mongolia, we can see the original skull bones and the sutures and boundaries between them. 
So using juvenile skulls, I was able to kind of map out what bones I was looking at and then map some of the capitaculae to the underlying skull bones. So you'll see the same color pattern used throughout my talk for all of these different skulls. Uh, so once I was able to sort of map out what uh, osse or, um, capitaculae are found at different parts of the skull, you can start comparing across different skulls, um, which is really helpful. <clears throat> so I did that for all of my skulls. So I have all these nice rainbow ankylosaur skulls, a very pretty PhD thesis results from that. Um, and we've got uh, a lot of variation, but also a lot of similarities. So some of the things that are uh, similar between all of the skulls are things like the fact that they always have squamosal horns, these red uh, capitaculae here. They always have um, a capitaculum, two capitaculae that sort of form a ridge over top of the orbit. They always have this big hexagonal capitaculum right on the middle of the nose. And they've got these sort of rough rugose capitaculae over the nostrils. So things that do end up varying are the number of these blue osteoderms or uh, capitaculae. These are the frontonasal capitaculae. Uh, so the exact pattern of those uh, capitaculae does vary between individuals. But the overall pattern is fairly similar. And when you actually sit down and count them, because that's lots of fun, um, they actually don't vary a whole lot in number either. Most of them only vary between about three or four capitaculae in total. So it looks like they're all really different, but they're actually not not as different as you might think. Um, so that was pretty interesting. So I can start to come up with some ideas about what may be the same and what may be different between individuals. Uh, in particular, what was really important was when you look at the skulls in lateral view or side view. So here's Amon H5405. This is a, a Canadian Museum of Nature 8530. And if we look behind the eye, so uh, CMN8530 is a squished skull. You can see that pretty easily. It's a much flatter skull um, compared to Amon H5405. If we look, here's our orbit in Amon H5405. If we look behind the orbit, it's really smooth in this area. There's no, there's no ornamentation behind the eye in Amon H5405. But in CMN8530, we've got little capitaculae, little ornamentation running along the quadratojugal horn and along the base of the squamosal horn. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and it turns out, oh, there's, there it is, in case you hadn't seen it before. It turns out that um, some of these variations are actually uh, stratigraphically separated. So one of the things that I did was I mapped out uh, where all of the different ankylosaurs or euoplocephalus skulls had come from. Uh, and so this is really high tech. This is Google Earth. But Google Earth is actually pretty good for doing this kind of stuff, as it turns out. Um, so we've got a couple of different clusters of areas where we find them. Uh, we've got some specimens from Montana over the border and in southern Alberta. But most of the vast majority come from Dinosaur Provincial Park or the area between Drumheller and Dry Island. So let's zoom in there. Here's Dinosaur Park, and here's uh, sort of Drumheller to Dry Island. And most of us should probably be familiar with this, but if you overlay a geological map of Alberta onto this, in Dinosaur Provincial Park, we have the Dinosaur Park Formation. And uh, from Drumheller up to Dry Island, we have the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So we've got sort of two clusters of uh, Euoplocephalus from different formations. And as it turns out, all of the smooth skulled ankylosaurs, uh, Euoplocephalus, are from the Dinosaur Park Formation, and all of the ones with extra little ornaments behind the eye are from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. And as it turns out, <coughs> there's differences in the half rings as well. So all of the ankylosaurs with little ornaments behind their eye have extra little ornaments on their cervical half rings, and all of the ones with smooth skulls have no extra ornaments on their half rings. So there's another thing that kind of is linked between these two, uh, two sets of fossils as well. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, what about tail clubs? Let's come back to tail clubs since that's one of the things that sort of drove me to do this project in the first place. <coughs> so we've got basically three different morphologies of tail clubs that, that you can find in Alberta. Uh, skinny ones, round ones, and fat ones. So that's the technical terminology for them. Um, so we've got some that are very elongate, much longer than wide. Uh, a bunch that are basically circular when you look at them in dorsal view. Uh, they're about as wide as long, even if they're small. And then some that are much wider than long, um, again, independent of overall size. So that's, those proportions are kept even if the tail clubs are a bit smaller. So that's pretty interesting. And I thought maybe this had to do with growth, but maybe it actually had to do with species too. So let's take a look. Here's our dinosaur provincial park ones. Here's our drumheller to dry island ones. And it turns out 
the skinny tail clubs and round tail clubs are all found in the dinosaur park formation, and the wide, slightly triangular tail clubs are all found in the Horseshoe Canyon formation. So that is very interesting. So we've got skulls with extra little bumps and cervical half rings with extra little bumps and really wide tail clubs in the Horseshoe Canyon formation and smooth skulls, round tail clubs, and uh, uh, sort of regular half rings in the dinosaur park formation. So I would argue that this means that we've got two different species represented, at least, by the animals in Dinosaur Provincial Park and the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. As it turns out, the holotype of Anodontosaurus is this skull here, the CMN skull, and it's from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So I don't get to name a new ankylosaur, but I get to bring back an old name, which is still pretty cool. And uh, the holotype of Euoplocephalus is from the Dinosaur Park Formation, so that's where we would now restrict Euoplocephalus to. So that's pretty fun. Uh, this, is, this is why stratigraphy is just so important for understanding what species you have. Because if all of your uh, blunt or sort of pointed tail clubs are found in one formation, all of your round tail clubs are found in another formation, they probably don't belong to the same species because it would be really hard for them to interbreed if they live at like different times in the fossil record. So you definitely want all of your members of the same species to live at the same time as each other. That's pretty important. <laughs> Um, so we've got Anodontosaurus in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and Euoplocephalus in the Dinosaur Park Formation. <coughs> so we can take Anodontosaurus out of our list of synonymies for Euoplocephalus. What about some of the other ones? Well, I'm not going to talk about Dioplosaurus too much because that's sort of an older project for me now. Uh, but back in 2009, uh, myself and Mike Burns and Robin Sissons, when we were all at the University of Alberta, uh, did a revision of this animal called Dioplosaurus. And the holotype is a very nice specimen at the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, also from the Dinosaur Park Formation. And it has a really thin, skinny tail club. Uh, there's also some differences in the pelvis and the unguals, the hooves, that can differentiate it from Euoplocephalus. <coughs> Unfortunately, its skull and its half, it doesn't have any half ring and its skull is really poorly known. So we don't know if it would have had the sort of smooth skull morphology or the skull with extra little bumps behind the eye. <clears throat> I also think that the narrow tail club knob is probably distinct for this particular genus, but it's a little bit harder to demonstrate that because we don't have as many fossils. We have two narrow tail clubs. One of them is at the U of A, and one of them is uh, on this specimen of Dioplosaurus. So I'm sort of tentatively saying that skinny tail clubs are probably a characteristic of Dioplosaurus. Okay, so we've removed another one of the synonymies out of Euoplocephalus. And at this point, I was like, Victoria, don't get rid of Scolosaurus because people aren't going to like that if you just like revive everything. Um, but you got to like, you got to try, right? So, so here's Scolosaurus. Scolosaurus is probably the most amazing of all of the uh, ankylosaur fossils from Alberta and especially from Dinosaur Provincial Park. Um, but I will point out that it has no head. And it has no tail club. The tail club should be over here. Um, and uh, can anyone remember what are sort of the important parts for telling apart the different species? The skull and the tail club. So that made my life a little bit more difficult. I was like, hmm, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with this one. Besides that, it's an amazing specimen. It basically has the entire body preserved with all the armor in place. And that's really significant because, again, those osteoderms sit in the skin. So a lot of the time, they kind of fall off and wash away while the animal is rotting because, of course, the skin rots off, which is you know, nice to think about. But the skin rots off, and then the osteoderms kind of wash away, too. Uh, but not only are the osteoderms preserved, but you also have scale impressions, so sk true skin impressions around all of those osteoderms, which is really cool. So this is a very important uh, fossil for understanding what these animals actually look like in life, where different osteoderm shapes fit on the body. Um, we just didn't really know like what animal it is, so that's kind of a problem. But the nice thing is that Scolosaurus has a cervical half ring, both of them actually, the first one and the second one, they've got two. <coughs> so I was able to compare the half ring morphologies. So here's our half ring for Euoplocephalus that I showed earlier. It's sort of down in the right corner labeled by B for anyone who's watching this later on. <laughs> um, and Scolosaurus has very round uh, flat osteoderms on the half ring. So Euoplocephalus has tall keeled osteoderms on the cervical half ring. Scolosaurus, on the other hand, has round ones with just kind of a little central bump in the middle. So they're very low, they don't really have a tall keel. So that's pretty interesting. And as it turns out, all of the Euoplocephalus specimens from Montana share the exact same morphology. So there's an isolated one from Montana that, again, has nice circular osteoderms with a little bump in the middle. You can see how flat they are here in uh, anterior view. 
And there's also a specimen here at the Terrell Museum that was collected from Montana that also shows the exact same morphology. And that skull is real, or that particular specimen is really important because it has a skull, which is great. Hooray, it has a skull. So we have a half ring that can link us to a skull, and now we can compare it with other skulls from Montana. There's about four of them. And the neat thing is that the skull of the Montana specimens is actually very different from the skulls from Alberta of Euoplocephalus and Anodontosaurus. So here's Euoplocephalus, here's Anodontosaurus, and if we take a look at our squamosal horns, um, they're pretty triangular and sort of about as tall as they are um, wide across the base. But the ones from Montana are very, very long, and they're kind of like backs up, so they sort of like tip down a little bit. Uh, we need to be a little bit careful because we're not sure if this is totally related to taphonomy or taphonomic artifacts, but it's really consistent across all of the different skulls, and certainly the length and the curvature are pretty unique. So it seems like Scolosaurus actually is distinct from Anodontosaurus and Euoplocephalus. It has a very different uh, squamosal horn morphology, a very different cervical half ring morphology, and we can differentiate it from Dioplosaurus because the pelvis is different. So we can differentiate it from all of the different ones. So again, we've got long back swept squamosal horns, um, a half ring with low round osteoderms, and that specimen here at the Terrell also has a round tail club. So we know it has a basically a round circular tail club. <clears throat> now you might notice here that I've got it's from the Dinosaur Park Formation or the Old Man Formation, uh, as well as the Two Medicine Formation from Montana. Scolosaurus is kind of an interesting specimen in terms of its uh, history and the story of its collection. This is a specimen that was found a very long time ago during the initial sort of dinosaur rush in Alberta, and it's now at the British Museum on display there. Um, but when it was uh, collected, uh, it was collected by a guy named Cutler, who sort of was an interesting character in the history of paleontology of Alberta. Uh, Cutler always worked alone. He was sort of this rogue dinosaur hunter. Uh, and while he was excavating this massive ankylosaur, it fell on him. So that ended poorly for him. I think it broke his leg, uh, and he wasn't found for like a day or two. Uh, uh, one of the Sternbergs found him and got him out of there. So Cutler wasn't able to finish the excavation. Uh, and it was one of the Sternbergs who actually finished collecting it. And so um, one problem, though, is that we're not 100% sure where exactly in Dinosaur Provincial Park this amazing ankylosaur came from. So Darren Tankey uh, here at the Terrell has been doing a lot of work trying to figure out where exactly Scolosaurus comes from. We were out last summer trying to pinpoint exactly where it's from. Uh, we think we've got it like mostly narrowed down, but it's definitely a little bit up for debate about whether or not it's from the Dinosaur Park Formation or the underlying Old Man Formation. Um, but we know that it's from somewhere in that general stratigraphic range and also from the two medicine formation in Montana. So Scolosaurus is definitely one that we want to spend more time on. Okay, so I did it. I got rid of all of the synonymies. Um, oops. <laughs> so where we once had four species, we then had one species, and now we have four species again. So we sort of come full circle. Uh, so now we have at least four different ankylosaur species in the Dinosaur Park and Horseshoe Canyon formations of Alberta. We also have ankylosaurus proper in the Scholard Formation. Um, but where we thought we only had one, we now have four. So that's pretty neat. So we know that Scolosaurus is mostly known from the Two Medicine Formation plus the holotype from, from Alberta. It's got these long uh, backswept squamosal horns and a round tail club, kind of like Euoplocephalus. Euoplocephalus has a smooth uh, skull behind the orbit <coughs> and kind of triangular squamosal horns. Uh, Anodontosaurus has um, lots of little ornaments behind the eye and a really wide and pointed tail club. And Diaplosaurus is a little bit more en enigmatic, but it is a unique pelvis, and it's got a skinny tail club. So <clears throat> we have this really nice diversity of ankylosaurs from Alberta now. In fact, one of the richest diversities. And when we put that on the stratigraphic chart, it now looks a little bit better. This looks a little bit more like what we see in other dinosaurs from Alberta. So we've got Anodontosaurus, mostly known from the upper part of the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. Interestingly, we don't really have any from the lower part of the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So that suggests there might be something interesting uh, environmentally related going on. <coughs> in the Dinosaur Park Formation, we still have kind of a lot of ankylosaurids, so that's a little bit weird. We've got Euoplocephalus, Diaplosaurus, and Scolosaurus. We have like one occurrence of what I think might be Anodontosaurus, so that's also pretty interesting. 
Um, in the old man and foremost formation, we don't really know what species we have there right now. Um, if I had to guess, it would probably be something like scolosaurs, but all of the material is really fragmentary, so we can't really tell what species we have right now. And across the border in Montana, we've got scolosaurus as well. Uh, so that's pretty neat. It's, it's not very common to find the same genus across the border, which you know it, you wouldn't think it would be that big a deal, but usually we don't find the same genus in the two medicine formation and in the dinosaur park formation. So that's something that also probably warrants a little bit more investigation. Um, and like I said, trying to figure out why we don't have many ankylosaurids in the lower part of the Horseshoe Canyon formation is interesting. So we answered one question, but we made a bunch of new ones by accident. That's how science works. <coughs> All right, so but that's really great, and it's always really nice to figure out how many species you have in Alberta. We can now ask some more questions about environmental preferences and why we're finding some in some areas and not in others. But what else can we do with what we've learned about Euoplocephalus for other species? Well, now that we've got sort of a terminology for understanding the cranial ornamentation pattern, we can start to look at other ankylosaurs and how their cranial ornamentation patterns differ. And in particular, Ankylosaurus, who is the most famous of all the ankylosaurs, actually turns out to have really weird cranial ornamentation. Um, and in particular, it has a very weird nose. Ankylosaurs already have really weird noses, but Ankylosaurus has like the weirdest nose of all the ankylosaurs. So we always think about their tail clubs, but they have really weird noses too. So now you know. So Euoplocephalus, here's his nose. He's got this kind of uh, supernarial capitagulum in sort of teal here. And Kylosaurus, his, no his narial opening or his nostril is sort of tucked back on the side of his face rather than being at the front and facing forwards. And it looks like this, uh, this particular capitagulum in light blue here, I call the L'Oreal capitagulum, it's like it's expanded and it's become very bulbous and it's kind of pushed the, the narial opening sort of out to the side and out of the way. I have no idea why it's like this and I don't know what the function is, but it's really interesting and we can use this to identify this and now ask some more questions about why Ankylosaurus has such a weird nose. So that's one area of investigation to go next. Uh, now that we've got our cranial ornamentation patterns named, it's also going to be a lot easier to identify different and new species. So for example, uh, Mike Burns and I have been invited to work on a new ankylosaur from New Mexico with Bob Sullivan and Spencer Lucas that they collected a few years ago, and we've just submitted that for review, so hopefully that'll come out fairly soon. It looks a lot like Euoplocephalus, but it has some unique things as well. So we think that it's something new, and that'll be really cool. I'm also currently working on a new ankylosaur from Mongolia and revising all of the ankylosaurs that we know from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. And that's definitely been made a lot easier uh, through my large sample size of Euoplocephalus, being able to figure out what is taxonomically significant for identifying new species from Mongolia. And so it's sort of missing the front of its snout here, but the rest of it's really nicely preserved. Here's his eye, and he's got lots of little neat little ornaments behind the eye. So that's kind of exciting, and we're going to see where that goes. <clears throat> so it's, all, it's fun to figure out what species you have. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun to name new species. Uh, but beyond naming new species, it's also really important to know how those species are related. So a big part of what I was doing for my thesis is not just identifying species, but figuring out how those different species are related to each other and what that tells us about the evolution of the group. And in particular, I'm really interested in understanding how dinosaurs from Mongolia are related to the ones in Alberta. Because we actually share a lot of similarities in our dinosaur fauna uh, between Alberta and and Mongolia. That's because we were probably connected to Mongolia a couple of times throughout the late Cretaceous through Alaska, through the Bering Land Bridge. So dinosaurs would have been able to migrate from Central Asia up uh, through sort of the eastern side of Russia and then down into the western part of North America. But the timing of that, uh, when that happened and how many times it happened, is a little bit up for debate. And in particular, there's a couple of really weird ankylosaurs, uh, like Nodocephalosaurus, also from New Mexico, that bear a lot of similarities to some of the ones in Mongolia. So Nodocephalosaurus has really lumpy, bumpy cranial ornamentation, which is something we see in the Mongolian ankylosaurs, but not in the North American ones. The North American ones tend to have flat capitagulae. So the question is, if we've got a bumpy-headed ankylosaur in North America, did it evolve that bumpy headedness independent of the ones in Mongolia? Or does this represent a little Mongolian lineage that has moved into North America? And if so, how did Nodocephalosaurus get all the way down to New Mexico without leaving any relatives behind in Alberta who also had bumpy skulls? Because he would have had to come down through Alberta and through Alaska, but we don't have any bumpy headed ankylosaurs in Alberta. 
So that's one of those questions that's a little bit tough to answer, but something that I'm kind of working on as part of a bigger review of ankylosaurs and their biogeography and evolution. So uh, having a really good sample size of Euoplocephalus and understanding cranial ornamentation and variation and variation from taphonomy is really important for being able to untangle other ankylosaurs where we might only have one specimen or maybe just a few specimens. So our Alberta ankylosaurs are really important for understanding global ankylosaur diversity and evolution. That brings me to the end. Thanks everyone for coming out on this snowy March day and I'm happy to answer any questions about ankylosaurs.